minutes, startling. Ah, and we're recording, great. So we're gonna be talking about Snebryonids, darkling beetles, um, and uh, also known, the larvae are known as uh, wire worms, right? So there's a ton um, of diversity out there within this family. And this might be more what you think of when you think, when somebody says the word Tenebrionidae, some, something like this might come to mind, maybe a, a, a flower beetle, a, a forked fungus beetle, maybe a desert stink beetle or, or a Zephobus, the, the mealworms, the superworms, um, uh, false wire worms. So, uh, but there's a lot of diversity to this family. Uh, and, and I might make, um, a claim that I can't really back up with data, but as far as any of the big families of beetles, um, I think Tenebrionids uh, look like the most other types of beetles, just kind of in general. Um, and, and really, you know, just span a, a wide range of morphological uh, diversity. So a big portion of the Tenebrionid fauna is really dry adapted. They're species that are um, really well suited for desert environments. And that's where we see them really dominating uh, kind of species diversity. Uh, and, and we've probably seen a lot of these, the, uh, the uh, blue death feigning beetle, um, the, the fog basking beetles th that are in South Africa. Uh, we see a lot of cool shapes of these, these flattened beetles um, that either live in and under sand or right at the surface of it. We see things that live on, in coastal sand dunes, um, lots of myrmecophiles. And so we have these, these beetles that oftentimes um, you know, have this blue wax and they're really well adapted for deserts. Uh, but there's also a lot of diversity within forests. Um, and here, these, these beetles tend to still be um, well suited to kind of drier micro habitats. So you tend to find them in fungus and in dead logs and in leaf litter that's a little bit better drained in general, maybe than, than your carabids and some other beetle groups. Um, but there is also a large component to the family uh, that do live in forest and, and into tropical situations. So um, we're not really gonna talk much about other beetle families, but we do wanna talk about what is a Tenebrionid, which does get into, well, how do we tell it apart from other things? Um, and so we have to start with the superfamily, Tenebrionoidea. Um, and this superfamily is, you know, used to be called Heteromera, right? They have different tarsal formulas, five, five, four. So the front and middle legs have five tarsal segments. The hind leg has four. Um, this works for most Tenebrionoidea. They at least never have five tarsomeres on the hind leg. Um, no, but these do get reduced to four, 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 three, 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 et cetera. Um, but 554, five, uh, and they have what's called the heteromeroid trochanter. On uh, this picture might be a little difficult to see, but the, the trochanters on their legs, right? So we think there's the coxa, the trochanter, the femur. Um, and in most beetles, you know, the femur connects into the trochanter and the trochanter connects into the coxa. But if you look at a, at a tenebrionoid, this femur comes down and kind of overlaps um, the trochanter, and it almost looks like the femur is touching and connected here. Actually, internally with musculature, it still all goes through the trochanter, but it kind of has this appearance. Okay, so that, that helps distinguish tenebrionoids from other beetles. Um, and also uh, the male genitalia. So in most beetles, the, the genitalia, right, there's the tegmin that um, kind of surrounds where the penis comes out. Uh, within tenebrionoids, the tegmin isn't a, a complete loop. It's only sclerotized on one side. So for instance, here we have um, this, this penis that comes out here, um, but the tegmin here is only sclerotized either above or below, and it kind of has this membranous bit here. And so that's going to separate it from cucajoids and coccinoloids um, as well. Okay, so those are just kind of three characters for tenebrionoidia. Right, so what about tenebrionids proper? Um, and, and so um, here, <laughs> that's a really good question. And, and these characters will get you to tenebrionids about 99% of the time. But of course, with any big group of insects, there's always plenty of exceptions. Um, the big thing are three conate ventrites. So right, the beetle abdomen underneath, we have ventrites in 
tenebrionids and many tenebrionoids, there's five visible um, sternites, right? But the visible ones we call ventrites. So these first three are conate, they're fused, they're immo immovably fused together. And then these last two um, hinge and are not fused. This can be very difficult to tell in a specimen. You, def you definitely get a feel for it the more you do this. Um, but uh, you know, sometimes the, the only way to really know if they're fused together is to kind of dissect and clear the specimen um, to know. But three fused ventrites. Um, also the procoxy usually, almost always, are closed um, behind the procoxal cavity. Right, so this is the hypomeron right, of the pronotum. It extends around and comes behind the coxal cavity, behind the procoxy, um, and it fuses then here to the prosternum. And so we see that in tenebrionids, and that's a really good character to split out um, a lot of other similar looking tenebrionoids. And finally, the antennal insertions um, are generally concealed from above, right? So you have your antennae that come in here and they insert into the head kind of under this shelf. Um, and, and one term that you'll, you'll hear in, in this uh, workshop is the epistoma, right? So um, within most, uh, oh, how many, most beetles, right? The, um, the, uh, the fronds and the, the clypeus are kind of are fused together here. Um, and so usually there's a little suture that you can kind of tell that this is the clypeus there. Um, and then this is usually called the, the gina or the geni, plural, kind of like these, these cheeks before the eyes. But together they kind of form this ridge that is the epistoma above the mouth, right? And the antennae insert under that. Okay, so these three characters together do pretty well to um, characterize the family, at least externally. So now I um, just want to jump into just a really, really incomplete overview um, that's, that's going to kind of help um, talk about classification and kind of frame the rest of what we're going to talk about in this workshop. And we're really just going to touch on kind of landmark higher level stuff. And, and again, we're really focused on the Arctic North American taxa in this workshop. So there are so many important contributions that we're just not talking about, especially for world, worldwide. Um, tenebrionids. Uh, but we only have so much time. So first, quickly, I uh, just want to talk about some folks who really made huge contributions to describing species. Um, the first is uh, John Lawrence LeConte, active in the mid-1800s, um, and he described, you know, almost 300 species, group taxa, and quite a few genera, especially in the western uh, United States. We also had uh, Thomas Casey, another uh, US military uh, person who uh, described almost 800 species um, and 80 genera, uh, which we are all still dealing with the consequences of today. Uh, then we have the real big winner for, for North America and a broader concept is, is George Charles Champion, um, who authored the uh, tenebrionid sections of the Biologia Centrale Americana uh, volumes, and uh, he described over 900 species group taxa and 83 genera. Um, not too many of those actually get into uh, the U.S. and Canada, where that we'll be primarily talking about the rest of this, uh, but still wanted to mention him for, for the regional setting that we're in. And then also we have Frank Blaisdell, um, who uh, describe over 300 species, primarily from California and, and Western US in the early 1900s. But for thinking about classification um, and beetles, we can't not talk about La Cordaire. Um, so anyone who knows beetles has certainly knows um, about him. And this was the last time that all beetle genera were treated um, in their entirety. Uh, the tenebrionids were treated in volume five in his 1859 publication. And this is the primary kind of tribal and subfamily groupings uh, where they were first uh, erected and, and defined. Um, again, pretty outdated, 1859. Um, but we'll see that uh, we had a really long um, interim where nothing uh, got changed. Um, for North America, 
We also have to talk about George Henry Horn, another uh, prolific American uh, coleopterist. Um, and he actually did do a species level revision of the Tenebrionidae of North America, north of Mexico. Um, and he did species level tre treatments. There are um, diagnoses and, and keys to most groups. This is from 1870, but actually a number of groups, this is the most recent um, uh, usable treatment um, that exists, except for Casey coming later and messing up a bunch of things. Um, then we have Charles Watt, J.C. Watt, 1974. So, you know, about a bit over 100 years later, um, who's the first one to really look at subfamily classification for tenebrionids. Uh, in this paper, right, a revised subfamily classification actually looked at adults and larval morphological characters. This was really the first um, kind of phylogenetic analysis in, a, in kind of like a Hennigian um, context where we have, right, the, this idea of like kind of synapomorphies and characters that hold these relationships together. And so this was a huge step forward from Lacordaire um, from 1859. Uh, then very briefly, or very shortly after that, um, we have John Doyen from um, uh, Berkeley University and, uh, and his PhD student, Walter Schenkel, who's better known for being a, an ant uh, systematist and, and biologist. Um, but together, they, they really created some landmark publications that are what we still use um, and are basing most everything off of today. Uh, in 1980, they, uh, Schinkel and Doyen put out a, a paper that described adult internal morphology, um, females ovipositors, genitalic tract, and then defensive glands. Um, and this was the first kind of really comprehensive internal look at a lot of these groups. And then that was followed up in 82 by a, uh, the first quantitative analysis for the family, a morphological phylogeny, um, Doyen and Schinkel, where again, they, they look at a lot of tribes and look at relationships and what defines them. And then this kind of, these two landmark studies together um, really form the basis for the next decade, decade and a half, um, mostly by John Doyen, where he recircumscribed and diagnosed most tribes, um, primarily North American, also uh, collaborated and, and did um, a lot of tribes in, in Australia as well, but, uh, but this is really um, where we're at now. Um, and, and this is where most of our definitions come from. From these works, uh, he coined names for branches or lineages um, within the Tenebrionidae family. Uh, we have the Lagrioid branch, which we'll be, be talking about. Um, these, most of these used to be treated in the family Lagriidae, um, right, the, the long jointed beetles. We have the pamelioid branch, um, pamelioini. These are a lot of the desert dwelling, dry adapted species. And then confusingly, the tenebrionoid branch, which has nothing to do with tenebrionoidia, the super family, but is kind of this lineage within um, tenebrionidae, the family uh, revolving around the, the uh, subfamily tenebrionini. Okay, so that's kind of where we're at with classification. Um, and I just wanted to say a note again about, so this, for this workshop, right? Um, we really had to, we have to structure this by current classification, what's out there. Um, and we're trying to utilize identification resources. We kind of brought that in for how we want to set this workshop up. And that's a big thing that we want um, to deliver through this workshop is to make these identification resources more usable to um, non-experts, right? So that's kind of our focus of what we wanna to really get out of this. But at the same time, we're trying to incorporate our current kind of expert level knowledge. So we've had a lot of molecular work, but um, as you'll see, as we go through this, mostly that means that the molecular work says, hey, none of our groups are good. And we're still now in that phase of scrambling to say, well, what are natural groups and how can we circumscribe that? So. Um, we really wanted to present this all together, um, kind of in, in this workshop, uh, but also with the goal of being able to 
to help you all still use the existing resources, even if the groups are, may not be monophyletic and may change in the near future. So diversity, uh, about 31,000 described species worldwide. Uh, this is a, a new tally of some recent cataloging efforts. The old number that was often floated for the last 10 or so years was around 20,000. Um, so there's quite a few described species worldwide. Of course, we all know within insects, uh, that's nowhere near the actual diversity that, that likely exists um, in the world, but 31,000 described species arranged into about 2,300 genera worldwide. So a, a pretty large group um, of beetles. Again, historically split into these three branches, the pomelioid, lagrioid, tenebrionoid, plus there's this subfamily Zolodonini, which was kind of weird and unplaced um, in those three branches. And so now we're just gonna walk through some of these um, subfamilies. So first we have this pomelioid branch. Um, there are two subfamilies in the world that belong to the pomelioid branch. Uh, we have pomeliini and cudiagenini. Um, and important to note, which you'll hear me say a lot, it's not monophyletic, how about that? Um, in fact, definitely a few of these groups are not tenebs, turns out. Um, and, and we see that there are um, a few splits kind of in the basal uh, branching of our tree. This group largely inhabits arid environments um, and there's a lot of tribal endemicity that's localized to particular biogeographic regions. So the pomelioid branch, how can we tell them apart? So uh, first they lack visible membranes, which we'll talk a bit more about behind um, uh, vent or separating ventrites four and five um, from each other and four from, from three. There's no visible membrane between there. Um, the uh, male genitalia are inverted. So right, the, the tegmen and paramares here are underneath uh, the penis. And then also they have these long, well sclerotized paraprocts usually um, with terminal gonostyle in the female um, ovipositor. Uh, so uh, that said, <laughs> the nominate tribe Pomeliini um, actually do have visible uh, membranes between their, uh, their ventrites. Um, and so there's going to be some nomenclatural issues here. Uh, but uh, we're not going to worry about that because that's all in the old world. But, um, and we're not going to have to worry about too much for North America, thankfully. Uh, so the subfamily Pomeliini, there are 39 tribes worldwide. Again, uh, large diversity in body forms, shapes, sizes. Um, and uh, some really cool beetles that we'll be talking more about. So then we have the lagrioid branch. Again, it's not monophyletic, uh, but it was so close. And really it's just because of this little critter down here, Nilio, that is totally not related. Um, but other than that, it's mostly monophyletic. Lagrioini, this um, is, is monoph and yeah, yeah. So there's three subfamilies, Lagrioini, Phrenopitini, and Nilionini. Um, again, these, Nilio here is in, restricted to North and South America, but um, it obviously doesn't belong in this group. Uh, for this group is um, highest diversity is in the tropics around the world. So uh, the Lagrioid branch, Lagriaini, uh, they're nine tribes worldwide. They're um, most uh, easily recognized by having the penultimate tarsimere, the arrows a little bit off. Um, is lobed or um, kind of cup shaped underneath the insertion where the final, the fifth tarsomere comes off. You can kind of see that there. Um, sometimes those lobes are a little bit reduced. Uh, they do usually have visible um, abdominal membranes and many of them have defensive glands, which we'll talk a bit more um, soon. They also have these elongate gonostyle um, off of a three to four segmented coccyx here for the ovipositor. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, most of these are detritivores that live in leaf litter and under bark and that sort of thing. Um, and again, nine tribes worldwide, really diverse, um, uh, some really cool looking uh, beetles. So then we have the Phrenopatines. Um, and this is a, a smaller subfamily. Uh, there are three tribes worldwide. Um, more abundant in the tropics 
and they're mostly found in, in rotting wood or, or in leaf litter. Um, their antennae are, are compressed. They're kind of maniliform and or like clubbed at the end. Um, they have abdominal membranes are present on their, on their um, the ventrites. They lack gonostyle on the ovipositor um, and they don't have compound sensoria, which we'll talk about in a minute. We have some cool things here that, that mimic leucanids and a bunch of little leaf litter and, and dead wood dwelling uh, critters that are pretty cool. And lastly, we have Nilioniny, uh, which is just this genus Nilio, uh, which is neotropical and uh, is supposedly lagrioid, but doesn't actually belong there. So then we have the tenebrionoid branch. Again, um, not monophyletic, but largely this is just because of Nilio being there. So actually um, doing, doing okay maybe for these, these branches of, of the family, um, but the subfamilies are totally not monophyletic. So, um, so first we have Tenebrionini, the nominate subfamily. Um, and so there are 29 uh, tribes worldwide. Uh, Blap oh, and Blaptiny too, we'll, we'll kind of throw these in here. We'll talk about Blaptines in a minute. That's the most recently erected uh, subfamily. There's seven tribes of Blaptines, but which were recently pulled out of Tenebrionines. They have exposed uh, uh, membranes between their ventrites and they have defensive glands um, that we'll have, we'll talk about more um, in a little bit. They also have these compound um, sensory on the antennae or not. Um, they're kind of hard to characterize because as you can see, they're definitely not monophyletic. And in fact, they're paraphyletic with respect to all of the other uh, tenebrionoid branch subfamily. Um, so we're really going to have to restrict the definition of this subfamily eventually, um, maybe to things that have simple antennal sensilli, which we'll talk about soon. Also within the tenebrinoid uh, branch, we have the alleculines, previously treated as a whole family, the alleculidae. Um, but there are two tribes um, worldwide. These are pretty easy to recognize. They have pectinate tarsal claws. There are a number of other beetles um, families that have pectinate tarsal claws, but it's not super, super common. Um, they have exposed abdominal membranes. They have defensive glands. Um, and uh, most, maybe all have stellate uh, compound sensoria. Uh, but again, uh, we have three distinct clades which seem to present independent origins of these uh, pectinate tarsal claws. So uh, easily diagnosed, but unfortunately not monophyletic. We also have the diaporini, um, which has 11 tribes worldwide, exposed abdominal membranes, um, defensive glands are present. They have uh, these compound stellate antennal sensoria. Again, we'll talk about some of these characters in, in detail in a bit. Um, they also have these clavate or clubbed antennae. Um, true diaporines have these, this kind of um, crenulate ridge on the outside of the tibia, which is a really good character that we'll talk more about to, to identify things. Um, 11 tribes worldwide, uh, turns out not monophyletic. There are three distinct groups. Um, and if we start looking at defensive uh, glands, which we're gonna talk about, some of them have these annulated defensive glands. Some of them have them really simple. Uh, okay, so we have an issue here as well. Uh, Stenochiani, three tribes. This is a worldwide group. Um, it's actually a very large group for only having three tribes. Um, defensive glands are present. The abdomens have visible membranes and the antennae have what are called stellate uh, sensoria on um, these end uh, antennomeres. We'll talk about those again, again a bit more. They also often have um, these yellow cetal patches on their legs. Um, but so do a number of other groups. Um, again, not uh, monophyletic, but at least this cool looking beetle hegemona does not uh, belong, but maybe the rest are fairly monophyletic. So that uh, could be good. And finally, we have Zolodenini. Um, this subfamily was erected by Watt when he did his subfamily treatment of, of the group. Um, and even 
uh, in 2010, you know, there are no unequivocal synapomorphies that clearly associate this with any member of any of the three branches. Um, this is a, an oddball. It has open procoxal cavities, um, but also this thing totally looks like a tenebrionid. So, you know, just a normal boring tenebe. Um, so that's kind of uh, problematic. And it turns out it, it is a tenebe um, and it's probably associated somewhat with uh, the pomelioid branch. Okay. So all of those subfamilies, there's a lot there. We're gonna be going back through each of these subfamilies. We just wanted to put them out there. So at least the names are there and, and some concepts of them maybe are, are starting to form in your head so that in later lectures, um, we'll hear about them. Now I wanna really kind of focus uh, for a few minutes on the important characters, uh, some of which uh, we've already talked about. So this is a super important character, abdominal ventrites and membranes. Um, so, so if you kind of look obliquely, here is a, a pomelioid, um, a pomeliine actually, that um, has no membranes. And you can see these, these first three ventrites are connate, they're, they're fused together, and these last two hinge down, um, and you can't really see any exposed membrane between them, versus here we have our, our three Conate ventrites, here are two non-fused ventrites, and you see this membrane that um, clearly sticks out. Occasionally, these membranes are the kind of the same color as the integument, so you do have to take a, a second look sometimes. And if you ever have a greasy specimen, um, it can be difficult to see, but it is there, and it's one of those things that is super important. Um, you just need to kind of learn to see it, and once you see it, it's gonna change your life forever and you'll be able to identify tenebrionids. Um, also associated with this is, is how those um, ventrites hinge. So here without the exposed um, membrane, there's kind of a, a central hinge. So A here is with these, the end of the abdomen is pushed up dorsally. B, it's pushed down. Um, you can see it's supposed to, it's hinging over the middle where it connects and kind of these outer lobes are either kind of folding in or folding out um, here. And so if you do a cross section, um, there's no kind of membrane separating them. They're, they're pretty close together. Versus the tenebrionoid hinging where they are hinged laterally and not across the, the midline. So if you bend them kind of down, you know, the membranes uh, kind of connect these, these ventrites together. Um, and so again, this is where depending on how the abdomen's sitting, you have to look at the right angle to be sure that there's a, um, a membrane there. Okay, uh, the ovipositor is an incredibly important character for classification. Um, we'll, we'll be talking about this because a lot of the tribes are defined this way. Of course, it's not great if you have a single specimen um, and especially if that specimen is a male to know what um, group it belongs to, uh, but there are a number of characters associated with the ovipositor, um, right? We have the, the paraproct of the, of the ovipositor, usually kind of this long tube-like structure, and then you have the end bit, uh, which is called the coxite, or the coxites, right? We have a, a right and a left one, and then the coxites are either um, not subdivided or they are subdivided into up to four sections. And then we have the gonostyle, which are inserted into the uh, fourth coxite, if they are, or the terminal coxite, I should say. Um, and kind of the structure and the positioning of that gonostyle insertion uh, is important. Um, and so there's there are a few uh, images here that kind of help orient you to, to some of this. Um, so with this ovipositor, again, the landmark paper were, were Schinkel and Doyen in 1980, um, where they really described a lot of these. And so uh, they also talk a lot about the, um, the, the placement of the, um, of the baculus, which is kind of this sclerotized cuticular rod that helps support the paraproct and then also at the base um, of the coccytes. And we can see again in this 1980 paper, they kind of have this hand drawn kind of this is what we're feeling evolutionary tree, which is still uh, incredibly uh, 
uh, useful today. Um, and they also made some assumptions and, and, and statements about what the kind of primitive ancestral state was to, to the advanced states, um, which are all there. Then additionally, we have to look at the, the female genital tract. As, so not only the sclerotized ovipositor bits, but the actual tube used in oviposition, right? So um, a big thing here, we have this oviduct, right? Which leads to the ovaries, brings the eggs down. Um, we usually have a spermatheca, which is oftentimes this kind of coiled uh, cluster of little tubules that sits together. Um, other times it's, it's they're these round sclerotized things or, or variously shaped things. Sometimes there are multiple spermatheci that come off as individual tubes. Um, and then we also have the actual kind of tract here. Um, uh, so you have the, the vagina apically and then the bursa copulatrix um, kind of proximally where um, the actual fertilization event will happen. Um, and so the, the structure of all of this um, has been historically used uh, in tenebrionic classification. Um, and again, there's a lot of diversity here, but, but where is the, um, the spermatheca located? How, you know, is it this kind of capsular globular thing? Um, are, are these kind of like finger uh, projections coming off of it? Or is it a single kind of coiled uh, group of tubules? Um, and so there's some really cool things. And, and where does the spermatheca come off of the rest of the genitalic tract is also important. And then we also want to talk about defensive glands. So this is something we, we maybe haven't talked about so much or I haven't talked about so much so far this lecture, but very important. Many uh, tenebrionids are chemically defended. In fact, uh, all of the tenebrionoid branch is chemically defended. And this seems to go along with the presence of that membrane, right? The ability of the abdomen to kind of hinge and maybe open up a bit more. Um, we have these defensive glands. Some of them are, um, they're paired glands. Typically they are here between the seventh and uh, eighth sternites. And some of them can be everted like this case here. This is a Zephobus, um, which is the genus that has the superworms uh, in it. So, um, they'll actually just push out their whole defensive glands and empty the contents all over them. And it's a good way to avoid predation. Uh, in other species, the glands don't evert, but they stay internal. And they're these kind of elongate, um, kind of sac-like things. Sometimes they're short and sac-like. And in the lag reines, the some groups have defensive glands, some don't. And in one group, they actually have these weird long defensive glands that come out between the eighth and ninth ventrites, so in a different place, likely meaning a, a separate origin of defensive glands, at least one separate origin. So again, there's a lot of diversity here. Um, the size of them, whether or not they have what's called common volume, so they're, they're kind of two sacs that lead into this kind of pouch-like thing before the defensive uh, secretions are, are pushed out of the body, or are they fully separate from each other? Also, is it just a simple cuticular pouch, or are they annulated um, with these kind of rings of, of cuticle around them? Um, and so then there's also, um, Schinkel and Doyen talked a lot about where the secretory um, cells and parts are that actually are creating the defensive chemicals, um, though I don't, uh, know too many modern people who've had a ton of luck um, identifying those, but that's also an interesting evolutionary and classificatory um, uh, character set. And then finally, I wanna talk about antennal sensoria. So this is super important, um, and this is emerging as more and more important perhaps than it was uh, recognized to earlier workers. Um, and these SEMs are great, and these are pulled from an um, unpublished thesis of Luna Gray, and I really hope that this gets published because it's wonderful. So um, we have simple sensoria, right, or cetiform sensoria, and you can see these kind of yellow patches here. This is kind of what it looks like under a scope, um, and they're just single CD that are coming up, and, and each one of these is kind of this little depression with a single ceta coming out of it. And that's kind of what's 
what the insect is using to sense its environment. Then we have what we call stellate sensoria, or also can be called compound sensoria. And you see we have this single depression that has um, a whole bunch of CD coming out. And, and I think the term stellate might, it might in part come from just how these, the CD are arranged there, but especially under a microscope, a lot of times it's this kind of bright little blurry patch that looks kind of like uh, a star if the light's hitting it the right way. Um, and in some beetles like this, um, uh, Stenochian right here, they're super obvious. Like even here, um, you can see all of these little sensoria, but they can be very difficult to see because sometimes the CD in them are, are uh, black or the same color of, as the antenna, which means um, they don't stand out. And they're also oftentimes usually just on this apical edge. So again, if you have a dirty or a greasy specimen, it can be very difficult uh, to see these, but it's a wonderful uh, character. And the third type, um, which is much more rare among tenebrionids, are these placoid sensoria. And um, this seems to be a further specialization. Um, taxa that have these also have stellate sensoria, but they have these little flat discs in the middle of the depressions. Um, and they show up kind of as these little flat discs. And you can see they're kind of placed um, apically on these subterminal antennomeres. And so this is kind of where you want to come in and look under a microscope uh, to see if they're there. Um, and there are just a ton of different um, shapes and looks to these, you know, how many CD are in them, what's the structure, how are they, how are they arranged. Um, I think this is going to be a really important thing as we move forward with intenebrionid classification, um, which is both good for us for we need characters to find monophyletic groups, but um, also is difficult because without uh, SEM images, uh, even up to, you know, 200x under a dissecting scope, um, it's really hard to impossible to make out uh, the actual arrangement of the CD. Um, and so lastly, uh, we just want to talk about uh, a few useful references that are out there and what we're going to be uh, kind of referring to and trying to structure um, a lot of this workshop around. So first we have the book uh, American Beetles. The second volume, chapter 106, is Tenebrionity, um, Albio et al. 2002. That PDF is in the Google Drive. Um, and the keys uh, are very good. Um, they, they work pretty well. A few groups are problematic, mostly due to taxonomy, just because, yeah, they haven't been revised since Casey and that's a problem. But other than that, the keys work well, even though it's a bit outdated as far as uh, modern classification. Uh, but that's our, the primary re identification resource that's available um, and, it's, and it's great. Um, another book we'll mention, even though it's outside the scope of, of kind of the region we're talking about, are the Tenebrionid Beetles of Australia, uh, Matthews and Bouchard, 2008. Um, we only have hard copies of this, don't have a PDF, but this is great. Um, it's similar to American Beetles. They're, they're great keys, they're illustrations. You can get down to the genus level and they have a full, full species level checklist there as well. Um, and this is super useful because they have a lot of illustrations at the tribal level. Uh, there's also a book on the Tenebrionids of Chile. Uh, Vidal and Guerrero, 2007, has fantastic images and great cover of the, coverage of the fauna there. Um, and they have some keys to groups, but it's a great identification resource. Um, and we have that as a, a hard copy only as well. Um, but if you're interested in Tenebrionids of Chile, definitely, definitely um, look at that book. For North America that we will be talking about, we have a recent catalog, Catalog of the Tenebrionidae of North America, 2018. Um, it's a comprehensive nomenclatural and, um, work that also summarizes some of the known distributions. And this is um, Panama North. Uh, and it's available open access online. So we have that as a, as a resource. Also regionally, um, you know, so we have, we have the American Beatles volume for um, Canada and the United States. Uh, from Mexico through Panama, 
um, we're really left with the Biologia Centralia Americana, um, Volume 4, or Coleoptera Volume 4, Parts 1 and 2. Those are available on Biodiversity Heritage Library. Again, that was um, Champion, who did a pretty good job, but there aren't keys to most things. And there's so much undescribed diversity that, of course, it's difficult. Um, then there's also uh, Blackwelder's Checklist of Coleoptera. Um, part three has uh, Central and South America, right? It's kind of Mexico South. Um, this is still uh, what you're gonna have to use for, for South America um, since our uh, North American catalog stops only in uh, North America. There are also a ton of other great resources for other parts of the world that we're, we're not really covering. Um, in the Paleartic, there's the Paleartic catalog. Um, see, the Czech Republic, uh, and, and UK and uh, um, Sicily all have faunistic treatments of their tenebrionids. Um, so there are some great things out there as well. Um, but these are the primary resources kind of for the region that we're gonna talk about. And uh, I believe that that is it for our uh, first lecture here. Um, for the introduction to tenebrionids and subfamilies. Uh, so Kojin's there. I believe our next thing that we have uh, coming up is we want to um, take a, a quick break. Uh, I know there's a, a bunch of, of material that for those of you who haven't looked at tenebrionids um, might be a lot of new characters and, and names. Um, so yeah, we're thinking about a 15 minute break. Uh, we're going to keep the Zoom room here open. Um, and then uh, we'll come back and uh, we're going to do our lab activity that we're really excited about. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, and again, want to plug that we have the, we, you can submit photos. If you have any photos of things that you want to ID, we'd love to see them. We'd love to work with you on identifying them. Um, and uh, yeah, Kojin, what am I um, missing? One note, um, so yeah, during the, um, during the, your talk, the, the USDA folks noted that they couldn't access the drive. Um, so I'm trying, I, ju I just try to, to make a, um, what is that, like one, the, what's it called, sorry, uh, one drive folder. So um, for those of you all in like, who are on a USDA network right now, could you, can you see if you can open that, um, link I just put in the chat and if it takes you to a folder full of images. Uh, yes or no in the chat to see if it works. Hmm, okay. <laughs> you have we can to... work on that over the next 15 okay. minutes. So yeah, we'll now... work on that, um, try to get it up. Um, yeah, so uh, it's five after the hour and at 20 after we'll uh, try to resume back. We're looking forward to seeing you all for the for the lab component where we hope to get everybody interacting a bit more. And yeah, feel free to the Slack, feel free to um, ask questions in the Slack channel if you if there are any questions about Andrew's talk and one of us will get back to you.